Shortly after I finished university, I went backpacking through South America. And I'll never forget the day that somebody I met in the hostel said to me, do you know what you should do today? You should go to the cemetery. That was one of the most bizarre things that I've ever heard. Why would I go to a cemetery? That's not tourism. That's what you, not what you do when you go backpacking. But I was actually wrong. Because... When I went to this cemetery, it's the Recoleta Cemetery in Buenos Aires, I was absolutely amazed. It was such a new and a unique experience for me. And it was so educational. Now, to say I enjoyed the day is perhaps not quite the right term, but it was definitely something I wanted to pursue again. But why do we want to visit places that are associated with death? Why would we go to a cemetery on our holiday? Well, lots of reasons, really. People want to learn. People want to experience. They want to know what happened in the past. And it's also a great way of stopping negative things that have happened from happening again by raising awareness. And this happens in many shapes and forms. So since my visit to that cemetery, I've visited lots and lots of dark tourism sites all around the world. And probably you have too. You might not have realised it's labelled as dark tourism, but I'm sure by the end of this talk, you will be able to identify some examples of when you yourself have been a dark tourist. In fact, I would be fairly confident that most of us have been a dark tourist at some point in our lives. But what does dark tourism exactly look like in practice? What does it actually mean? Well, basically, dark tourism is tourism, that is associated in some way with death. Now, there are lots of different um, examples of this and lots of different extremes to which a tourist experience can be associated with death. And I'll give you a few examples. Sometimes dark tourism is associated with fun. Think zombie chases or escape rooms. These are fun events or activities that lots of people like to do. Some of them might be focused or aimed at children. Some might be more aimed at the adult market. But if they have a link in some way to death, it is an example of dark tourism. These are known as dark fun factories. On a more serious note, there are lots of dark exhibitions around the world. Think an exhibition about the Cold War or an exhibition about the concentration camps in World War II. Think museums, the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, the Vietnam War, etc. There are exhibitions like this all over the world. Now, these are not happy times. And inherently, when we think about tourism, we think about happiness. We think about holidays. And death is the paradox of that. But we enjoy, if that's the right term, we enjoy learning. And learning and education is a really big part of traveling and of being a tourist. So people all around the world will travel to go and see outfits, to travel to go and learn about, you know, the the Holocaust, to travel to Cambodia to learn about Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge regime. There are examples of this all over the world. And these are dark exhibitions. Whilst we might not walk around there smiling because we're happy, as you would typically expect on holiday, there is a sense of enjoyment in that we get to learn about this and we get to to, to educate ourselves about the things that have happened in the past. On a lighter note, there are dark dungeons. There are lots of dungeons or caves or prison type experiences around the world that have a link to death. So because of that, they are classified as dark tourism attractions. Some of them are very raw and are left in their natural state or the state that they were when they were last used. And others are somewhat Disneyfied, and they almost become a theme park or a ride. So for example, in London, they have the London Dungeons and it has live actors and it has a ride or a couple of rides in it. And it is very, uh, it's a very fun experience, but it is still serious in that you will learn about some very important and tragic histories throughout British history that occurred in that area. We also have dark resting places. So for example, when I went to that cemetery in Buenos Aires, that was a dark resting place. 
For me, that was so insightful. I learned a lot about the history. And there are lots of cemeteries or uh, tombs, etc., all over the world that tourists will flock to go and see. You might have some kind of connection, perhaps a religious connection or a, a cultural or a, a national connection, or maybe you just simply want to learn more. This image here is of the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem, which is a very big and popular dark tourism resting place. Also in Jerusalem, we have the Dome of the Rock. This is an example of a dark shrine, and there are so many shrines all over the world that tourists flock to, to go and visit, to learn, to remember. Another example of dark tourism is to visit a conflict site. There's been way too many conflicts than I care to count that have happened throughout the years in history, and many of them are now areas that tourists will like to go and visit. So for example, uh, when I was traveling in Vietnam, I went to see the Coochie Tunnels. This was the area where there, were, there was a lot of fighting and they used tunnels to navigate around. They've somewhat turned this into a tourist attraction because they've opened up these tunnels for tourists to go in and actually experience it for themselves. And other dark tourists will visit dark tourism camps or camps of genocide. Unfortunately, genocide has occurred throughout the world and people visit major attractions like Auschwitz in Poland to go and learn about these and to see where it happened. And the last of my types of tourism that I think is really worth mentioning is dark disasters. Disaster tourism is a type of tourism in its own right, but it also falls under that umbrella of dark tourism. When there's a disaster, Tourists won't usually flock there straight away, but in time people will visit, they want to see the destruction or the rebuild, things like earthquakes or, or tornadoes or tsunamis, and in time people will come to visit and remember, pay their respects and learn. So as you can see from all of these different types of dark tourism, we actually have a, a spectrum from light through to dark. Sometimes dark tourism might be very serious and very heavy, but other times it's somewhat light-hearted and fun. So dark tourism comes in lots of different shapes and forms, and it doesn't always look the same. But dark tourism is popular, and as I said, I bet you've been a dark tourist at some point in your life. As you can see through all of these examples, education really is at the core of dark tourism. It's an education in its own right, learning about these histories, about what may have happened in the past, about these things that are in some way associated with death. But the major question is, should we do it? Is it okay to visit graveyards? That picture that I showed you at the beginning of this talk, I was stood there smiling. But at the time, I wasn't sure. Naturally, for photos, I would usually smile. But... It feels wrong. It felt wrong. Should you smile? How should you act when you visit these sites? And these are some of the major ethical dilemmas that we have. And the key really is to be respectful when we visit these sites and to behave in a way that is appropriate. But what is appropriate? What isn't? Usually, dark tourism sites will become tourist attractions after a certain amount of time has lapsed. For example, a war doesn't end and one week later we're there as tourists to see what happened. I've read numerous articles that have suggested that Wuhan will be the next big dark tourism destination. But right now in 2022, with China having only opened up a few weeks ago, that's not going to happen anytime soon. It's, it's too close. It's too raw. So generally there will be a certain amount of time that will pass before a destination is deemed acceptable for tourism purposes, because there is that element of sensitivity that is generally involved with these sites. And then that leads us on to the question, how should we behave at these, de at these destinations? How should tourists behave and the stakeholders involved in the tourism industry, how do they best manage this provision to ensure that people are not offended, people are not upset? I remember visiting the Vietnam War Museum and seeing Americans, because there was a, a heavy play on what happened um, from the American side there, from the Vietnamese perspective. And I remember seeing people walking around absolutely sobbing, crying their eyes out. This was personal. They really felt a connection. I remember when I went to Cambodia and seeing people that had lost limbs during 
the Kumar Rouge regime. They're still living. They still have those living memories. This is real. This isn't a history book. Going to Chernobyl and seeing where that disaster site happened brings on such strong emotions. And there are still people in that area who have been affected, who were affected very, very strongly by that. So we need to act respectful and we almost need a, a code of conduct for dark tourism. Don't take pictures of people in moments of grief. Don't act inappropriately. If I was in that museum in Vietnam, telling jokes with my friend and laughing, whilst other people were walking around crying their eyes out, that would be totally inappropriate. So we need to have dark tourism because the educational element is just absolutely invaluable, but it also needs to be managed in such a way that it is respectful and we are respectful of all parties involved. So in answer to one of my original questions, why do we become dark tourists? Well, we w usually it's because we want to learn. We want enjoyment, you know, going to an escape room might be fun, but most of the time it, it is really about learning and about education. And that is one of my, my favorite sayings actually in travel and tourism is that travel is the best education. And going to these places and actually experiencing them and seeing them, it might not be your traditional happy, smiley holiday moment, but it is such a valuable experience. And this is why people around the world are moving away from the traditional sun, sea and sand holiday. Yes, we all still want to lie on the beach from time to time, but we also want something more and learning about other places, other cultures, other histories. That is one of the major things that is fueling the travel and tourism industry that we know today. Thank you very much for listening to this talk. I do have more information on dark tourism on my website, tourismteacher.com. So do have a look if you want to learn any more.